Well, good morning. Welcome to Grace Valley Christian Center's Adult Sunday School. In our reading this morning, for those of us who go through the Grace Valley reading list, we read Mark 10. And in that chapter, after Christ had spoken to the rich young man, his disciples and Christ said, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. And later in that chapter, we see why salvation is possible, because Christ said that he did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this great salvation that you have wrought. And Lord, it is only possible because you loved the world so much that you gave your only begotten Son, that whoever would believe on him would have eternal life. Lord, we pray that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would grant us true repentance and true faith, and help us to live for your glory. And we ask your blessing on this time with your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we're continuing with our series in Murray, John Murray's book on Redemption Accomplished and Applied. This is the fifth lecture, and we'll start off, as always, with a brief review. We've covered the necessity of the atonement, and then in looking at the nature of the atonement, Murray says that the specific categories the Bible uses to describe the atonement can all be classified under the rubric of Christ's obedience, and we discussed that. Christ's obedience can be classified as both active and passive. His active obedience refers to his keeping the positive demands of God's law, and his passive obedience refers to his satisfying the penal sanctions of God's law, all of which is done on our behalf. But we need to remember that Jesus was fully active and willing in everything he did. This was nothing that was imposed on him in opposition to his will. And it is through union with Christ that we are saved. Our sins are imputed to him and his righteousness is imputed to us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 is the great verse for that point. And this union with Christ is a topic that we will return to throughout this series because it is so important. Murray called it the mother of all doctrines. And this is also he called the central truth of soteriology as our union and communion with Christ. And the specific categories that scripture uses to describe the atonement are sacrifice, propitiation, reconciliation, and redemption. And we have covered all of those, and last time we finished, we were discussing the, specific, the final specific category of redemption. And we had shown this quote last time, but I thought it would be good to remind ourselves. Murray writes, just as sacrifice is directed to the need created by our guilt, propitiation to the need that arises from the wrath of God, and reconciliation to the need arising from our alienation from God. So redemption is directed to the bondage to which our sin has consigned us. If you can agree and say amen to that whole paragraph, then praise God because you believe in biblical Christianity. But that paragraph flies in the face of much of what goes on around us under the name of Christianity because people don't believe in a wrathful God who needs propitiated, needs to be propitiated, they don't believe in a God who is somehow alienated from us, and they don't believe in any kind of need for reconciliation, and they certainly don't believe that we are in bondage to any kind of sin or anything else for that matter. We're free people, right? We're Americans, so we're free. People in some other country might be in bondage, but, but we're free. Well, that's a lie. We're not free. And Jesus himself indicated that his sacrifice was in some sense like a payment of a ransom. I just read the verse from Mark chapter 10, but also last time we showed Matthew 20, 28. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And from what did Christ redeem his people? Well, last time we showed that he had redeemed his people from the curse of the law, but not the law itself. What is the summary of the moral law, the Ten Commandments? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. We are certainly not in any way taken away from having to keep that moral law. That is still incumbent on us as Christians. But we are free from the curse of the law. 
And then today we'll finish the last four things here and then move on. We are also free from the ceremonial law, from the law of works, from the guilt of sin, and from the power of sin. So let's go on and take a look at the ceremonial law. This is an important point which really does a wonderful job of illuminating one of the passages in Scripture that is sometimes a little hard to understand in Galatians. So in Galatians, Paul argues against legalism, of course, and very strongly so. And salvation is not attained, as his main point here, by keeping the law. So near the end of Galatians 3.19, then he asks the obvious question, well, what then was the purpose of the law? Why did God give the law if the law couldn't save people? Because that's clearly the most important need for all human beings after the fall is to be saved to be put back into a right relationship with God. Nothing else really matters. So why would God give the law? Well, here's the answer Paul gives. The law was our guardian. It's an interesting word. In the Greek, the root word there is pedagogue. And a pedagogue, you know, we think of a pedagogue as a teacher, but a pedagogue was actually typically a slave who was assigned to watch over the children. And the slave's job was to take the children to and from school and to oversee their entire upbringing. So it was a guardian, you could call it. Um, Anyway, so the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. We're not justified by keeping the law. We're justified by faith. But the law had had a purpose. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So something has changed. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith, And he goes on, and heirs according to the promise. And this is from the ESV, by the way, because they use the word guardian here, which is a little better than our NIV. And he goes, he then treats the idea that heirs are treated differently at different times in their life. So this is the passage that I think is very important to understand what Paul's argument is. The heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. So what's the idea here? The idea is the heir of an estate is, you know, the owner of the whole thing. As soon as the father dies, he's going to be the one who owns it all. So in a sense, he's the owner of everything. But while he's still a minor child underneath these guardians that his father has assigned, he's just like a slave. He does what the guardian tells him to do. He's under that control. And Paul is equating the church, the people of God, to this relationship of the guardian to the minor heir in the Old Testament times, Paul is equating the church under the law to that relationship. And then he goes on and he says, in the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. So we here, meaning the church, the people of God, looked at historically. So in the Old Testament dispensation, we were children and we were under the tutelage of the law. We were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons, which is, again, a marvelous principle that we'll talk about more in the second half of this course, the adoption that we have, which is a marvelous privilege. Uh, In fact, uh, Murray calls it the apex of our privilege and grace as a Christian. So what Murray's commenting on this, he says, what is in view here is redemption from the tutelary bondage of the mosaic economy. So a a tutor, again, is like a guardian. It's somebody who's tutoring or or the guardian uh, who's entrusted with the care of the minor child. And that was what the mosaic economy was. In other words, under the dispensation of the Old Testament when the mosaic law was what was in force. The people of God under the Old Testament were children of God by the divine adoption of grace but they were as children under age, under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Of this tutelary pedagogical discipline, the mosaic economy was the minister. So again, there's the point that Paul is making, that the Old Testament church is like a minor heir. It's still an heir. It's still the beloved son of the father. It's still going to receive the full inheritance. It's under grace and all of these things. But in the Old Testament dispensation, it's like that heir as a minor under the rule of guardians, which is the law to the church. And then you move into the New Testament dispensation, and there's no need for that guardian anymore. But why? Because the child has been properly taught and properly, been, and properly raised. The law is still in force, but the child no longer needs the guardian or the tutor in order to cause the child to keep those laws. He has grown up into a man who keeps them because he's been properly trained and understands. 
So the ceremonial law was part of the Mosaic economy and has been abrogated. We're not going to go through the scriptures to prove that. It's a fairly clear point. You can see that especially in Hebrews, of course. And you can go look at Hebrews 7, 11, and 12, which talks about Christ coming in as a new high priest in the order of Melchizedek as opposed to the previous Levitical priesthood. And in those verses, it makes the point that when there's a change in the priesthood, there must be a change in the law. These things go together. And then you can look at Romans 10, 4, which is the verse that, Christ, that says Christ is the end or the goal of the law. That's often misinterpreted to mean that we're no longer under law in any way, shape, or form, that we don't need to keep it, but that's not what's meant. What's meant is that Christ was the end, the goal that the law pointed forward to. He fulfilled it in our behalf. Doesn't mean we don't need to, but he did it in our behalf for our salvation. So the difference between the people of God in the Old Testament and the New Testament is likened to the difference between a minor heir, as we've said, still under the control of a pedagogue, and an heir who has come of age and is free. Once the heir comes of age, he's been trained and no longer needs the external restraint provided by the pedagogue, but he is still expected to live by the same rules. And similarly, the moral law is still in effect, while the ceremonial and civil laws are not but we are not in bondage to the law. We are not slaves of the law in any way or to sin. So the church has come of age and is no longer in need of the law as a pedagogue. And there are a couple of verses here that I think are, are important in this regard. Jeremiah 31, 33. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. So this is speaking about the New Testament times the time of Christ, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And it made me think of Proverbs twenty-two twenty-six: train up a child in the way he should go even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, I must, I think, treat a common, again, misapplication and perversion of this verse from Jeremiah. We do not want to establish our conscience as king, right? Because our consciences can be defiled. It is wrong to go against conscience, as Luther said, and so forth, but that conscience must be captive, as Luther said, to the Word of God. So my conscience is not the ultimate authority. I can't just stand back and say, oh, well, the law is written in my heart, and I feel it's okay to divorce my wife because I'm really in love with this other woman, and surely God wouldn't want me to stay living with this woman if I'm not in love with her. That wouldn't be honest. People come up with all kinds of crazy things, right? But I need, to be, I need to be under the Word of God again, using my own mind, not in a magisterial way, but in a ministerial way, in service to the Word. So if my conscience is bound by the Word of God, then this is true. The, the law is written on my heart, and I should do what that says. But I can be against that, so I have to be careful. I have to look to the Word of God, not to just my own silly thoughts and think that God has written the final authority within me. No, the final authority is the Word of God. All right, Murray says, Christ has redeemed us from the necessity of keeping the law as the condition of our justification and acceptance with God. Now, that sentence, I think, could be very easily misinterpreted. So you have to ask, can anyone be justified by keeping the law? And, you know, Murray certainly did not intend to imply that anyone can be. And elsewhere, he wrote the following. I took this from the Collected Works of John Murray, Volume 2. Murray writes, Paul says in Romans 2.13 that the doers of the law will be justified. But he goes on to show that there are none such. There are no such people. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So this is a point we may get into later when we deal with the chapter on justification under redemption applied. And it's a very important point. But, you know, what is the purpose of the law even in the Old Testament? Was it ever meant to save anybody? And the answer is no, okay? And could anybody ever keep it? No. And then there's this question people sometimes ask, especially if you're talking to people who aren't Christians. Well, what if somebody kept the law perfectly? Wouldn't God then save them? Well, that's a purely academic question because I can always just say, well, have you kept God's law perfectly? You know, it's, it's a completely moot point in a sense. We are guilty in Adam because he was our federal representative, but the Bible also says everyone will die for his own sin. It's a completely moot point because I, I get a sinful nature from Adam. I sin because I'm a sinner. I have a sinful nature, not that I'm a sinner because I've sinned. And so there is no person outside of Christ who ever has or ever will lead a sinless life. So it's a completely academic point to ask what would happen if somebody did. We don't really need to answer that question. All right. So redeemed from the law of works. What does it mean? Well, perfect righteousness is necessary for a right relationship with God. 
And Christ redeemed us by perfectly fulfilling the law on our behalf, because none of us is capable of being perfectly righteous. And so in Romans 5.19, we read this wonderful verse, for justice through the disobedience of the one man, of course, meaning Adam, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. And we obtain this righteousness through union with Christ. As I've said, this is our theme we're going to see over and over and over again as our union with Christ, which is by grace through faith. And sin shall not be your master, we're told in Romans 6.14, because you are not under law, but under grace. So, what is a life under grace? Well, grace is God's favor shown to those who deserve his wrath. It's not just unmerited favor, It's favor given to those who merit the exact opposite. They merit God's wrath. And God's grace has power. This is not some abstract principle. It's not like my saying to you, oh, go and have a nice day. That's not God saying, go have a nice day. That's not what grace is. Grace has power. You look at 2 Corinthians 9, 8, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. It has a purpose. It has a power to it. And Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. And when you read the New Testament, if you have this idea in mind that grace is not some abstract principle or some nice comment made or something, grace is an active, powerful force mediated by the Holy Spirit of God, then you'll start reading the New Testament with a different understanding when it talks about somebody seeing the grace of God in a situation or on a person. What are they talking about? They're seeing the effects of the power of that grace working through that person's life. All right, so redeem, what does it mean to be redeemed from sin? We're now on to that one. Well, in the introduction to Revelation, the Apostle John wrote, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve as God and Father. So clearly, this establishes that we have been set free, or you could say redeemed, from our sins. But Murray focuses on two aspects of sins here. He says we've been redeemed from both the guilt of sin and the power of sin. So let's take a look at those. So the result is that our sins are forgiven and we are justified. This is a judicial or a forensic act. Murray uses the word juridical which just means the same thing essentially as judicial, all right? And the scriptural basis for this idea that we are, that we are uh, saved, redeemed from the guilt of sin is given in a couple verses here. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So what does it mean to be justified here? It means to be set free. It means to be declared just and righteous. And then in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So again, we see the scriptural basis for this, and there are many other scriptures we could have put up, but these will suffice. And what does it mean to be redeemed from the power of sin? Well, Murray says we are also redeemed from the enslaving defilement and power of sin. So the power of sin is sort of twofold, if you will. And we'll look at two scriptures here, Titus 2.14 Jesus Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own. This is a common theme throughout the New Testament, this idea of being purified. And Old Testament images of washing and so forth are often used. But the idea is that there's a defilement of sin. It makes you dirty. It's like going out and playing in the mud. You need to be washed. You need to be cleaned. And there's that aspect of the redemption, that we are being purified, but then there's also another aspect of it, which is to be removed the power, taken out from underneath the power of sin. So look at 1 Peter 1.18, for you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers. Well, what is the empty way of life? That's the way you used to live before you were born again. That's the life of sin. And you have been redeemed from that. In other words, you have been given power to live differently. You have the Holy Spirit. You have the Word of God. You have been given a new nature if you're born again. So you have the power to not live that old way anymore, but to live in a new way, in the newness of life, we're told elsewhere. So that's being redeemed from the power of sin. And Murray writes, redemption 
from the power of sin may be called the triumphal aspect of redemption. I like that word, and, and many, many years ago, well before I was born, when you read writings from Christians, they frequently spoke about somebody living a triumphant Christian life. I think that's an expression maybe we should get back into our language, to live a triumphant life. It, it emphasizes this idea that I have enemies, real enemies, namely Satan and my own sin and the world, and that I need to overcome them. We talk about living, they also talked about living an overcoming Christian life. Both of those expressions got used. And so being freed from the power of sin is the triumphal aspect of redemption. Not only is Christ regarded as having died for the believer, but the believer is represented as having died in Christ and as having been raised up with him to newness of life. It is this fact of having died with Christ in the efficacy of his death and of having risen with him in the power of his resurrection that ensures for all the people of God deliverance from the dominion of sin, Murray wrote. So you can go home and read Romans chapter 6, which speaks about our having died with Christ, our being raised with Christ, that we are no longer slaves to sin, but we are now slaves to Christ and to righteousness. Our union with Christ is much closer than just being associated with him in some way or united with him in some simple contract or something. He is with us and we are with him in some very deeply mysterious way so that his death and resurrection manifest themselves powerfully in our lives and we have real power to overcome sin, power to control our behavior. There's a couple of expressions that theologians use for this. Prior to our conversion, we were not able to not sin. Theologians like to use Latin all the time. Don't ask me why, but you may hear the phrase. So what's the Latin phrase? Non posse, non peccari. Not possible to not sin. That is the condition of everyone outside of Christ. It is not possible for them to not sin. But then when you are born again and you are in Christ, what's true of you? Well, you are able to not sin. You are posse non peccari. It's possible for you to not sin now. So that means your sins and my sins, if we have been born again, are much worse in God's sight than the sins of an unbeliever. An unbeliever has no choice. An unbeliever sins. That's all an unbeliever can do. I have a choice. Every time I sin, it is a repudiation of Christ's lordship. It is a repudiation of Christ's having purchased me by his blood. And it is an absolute affront to the holy God whom I serve and whose name I have taken. And so our sin is worse. Murray says that this forms the basis of the sanctification process. We have the power to overcome sin, Satan, and the world. So that leads to an interesting question. Are we redeemed from Satan? Some early church fathers thought of Christ's ransom as having been paid to Satan himself. But as Anselm and others have pointed out, Satan is a creature. And as a creature, he has no such authority, nor does any other creature have any authority to demand from God a ransom. So you can see that in Why God Became Man, book one, chapter seven, if you're interested. So the analogy of a ransom breaks down at this point. As with almost all analogies, we've gotta be careful to not push them too far. And the idea of a ransom sort of implies that there's a secondary power out there that you have to pay a ransom to. But, but God isn't paying a ransom to some other power. There is no other power that has any power over God or any ability to put God under obligation. So in that sense, the, the analogy of a ransom breaks down a little bit. But Murray points out that there was a great truth that the early fathers were trying to express with this idea. And that's shown in John 12, 31. Now is the judgment of this world now will the ruler of this world be cast out. Satan is the ruler of this world. He's called the God of the kingdom of the air in different places. So, but that's all under God's authority. Satan is not able to do anything that God doesn't allow him to do. Satan has no power outside of that which God grants to him. He's a very powerful being, but he has no power outside of that which God grants to him, which is why we're told in James 4 that if we resist the devil, he will flee. So, are we redeemed from Satan? No. Murray concludes in part, redemption from sin cannot be adequately conceived, uh, conceived or formulated except as it comprehends the victory which Christ secured once for all over him who is the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. So we must see that we are in a spiritual battle with real powerful enemies 
or we will be defeated. If you underestimate your enemy, it's a common adage in war, right? If you underestimate your enemy, you're going to pay for it. Well, if we underestimate our enemy, we're going to pay for it. All right, so you can go home and look at 2 Corinthians 2.11, which is the verse that says in the NIV, we are not unaware of Satan's schemes. More properly translated, we're not unaware of his thoughts. Satan puts thoughts into our mind. Where do all sins originate? Thoughts and feelings, emotions, right? And you can also go home and look at Ephesians 6.12 and following, which of course talks about the fact that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual powers, and talks about putting on the full armor of God. All right, what about application for chapter 2? We've now finished chapter 2 on the nature of the atonement. Um, and it, the nature of the atonement accomplished by Christ is such that we are not just forgiven, but we are radically changed and given power by grace and the indwelling spirit. So there are three things I think we should all do, and these are things we should do over and over and over again through our Christian life. First, we should make our calling and election sure. Do I exhibit the signs of new life? Read 1 John. Do I exhibit the signs of new life within me? If not, I need to repent. I need to cry out to God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Save me. If I do, then the first thing I need to do is be thankful for what God has done in my life. It's nothing in me. This is all something God has done. This is God's work from beginning to end. And then thirdly, I need to be worked by the power of the Holy Spirit to be transformed on a daily basis, day by day, and to do the good works that God has prepared for us to do, Ephesians 2.10. People love Ephesians 2.8.9, for it is grace you have been saved through faith, this not of yourselves, right, not by works so that no man may boast. They tend to forget about Ephesians 2.10. You are Christ's workmanship, or created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has created and prepared in advance for you to do, Right? So there's a purpose to our salvation. All right, what about the perfection of the atonement? This is now chapter three of Murray's book, and we'll actually get through it today, I believe. Well, maybe not. <laughs> the, atonement, uh, the atonement has been degraded in different ways through time. First, the Roman Catholic Church, of course, impugns both its efficacy and its once-for-all nature by their doctrines, notably what they call the sacrifice of the Mass. This idea that Christ has to be re-sacrificed in any real way is absolutely, completely unbiblical, radical idolatry and blasphemy. Christ's sacrifice was once. We are to do the Eucharist as a remembrance of his sacrifice, not as a re-sacrificing of Christ. And the idea that I can commit a mortal sin for which I will be sent to hell if I don't get in and, and do my penance and, and you know, go to a priest and ask forgiveness and so forth before I die, that again denies the efficacy of Christ's work. Modern liberalism reduces all this as we've seen to just a mere example. Christ was an example of a good person, shows us God's love and so forth, but you know, no real efficacy there. And true Christians sin by not firmly proclaiming this truth and living in a way that demonstrates its power. So the perfection of the atonement is an important thing for us to consider. And Murray begins by pointing out that only Jesus Christ can atone for sins. There are still painful consequences for sin in this life, but we do not atone for our sin. In Leviticus 26, it tells us a couple times, you will pay for your sin. Right? It will find you out, you will pay for it. We all know there are consequences for sin, but that's not atoning for sin. Atoning means to expiate and to reconcile and so forth. That's not what we do. We pay a price for our sin. There's no doubt. God shows us his displeasure, but it's not atoning. So whether opposing Roman Catholicism, liberalism, or any other heresy, we must be careful to maintain the biblical doctrine. And Murray writes, if we once allow the notion of human satisfaction to intrude itself in our construction of justification or sanctification, then we have polluted the river, the streams whereof make glad the city of God. That's quoting from a psalm. I've forgotten which one, 46 or something like that. So you have to realize what he means here by human satisfaction. He's talking about satisfaction for sins. He's talking about expiation. He's talking about redemption. He's talking about atonement. That's the idea. It's another word for that. All right, so under the perfection of the atonement, Murray examines it in four headings, the historic objectivity of the atonement, the finality, 
the uniqueness and the intrinsic efficacy or effectiveness it accomplishes what it was sent to accomplish. So the historic objectivity. Well, it's true that God is not bound by time in the same way that we are. Nonetheless, the atonement was made at a fixed point in the history of the world and is a real historical event. There are many scriptures you could use, but Galatians 4, 4 and 5, but when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights of sons. Don't allow yourselves to get sucked into any kind of spiritualizing of Christianity to where you say, well, it doesn't really matter whether it's historically true that Christ was born of a virgin and Christ lived and Christ died and, and you know, was crucified and died and was buried and was raised. You know, there, there are spiritual truths being taught in all of that, but you know, it's not really important that it be historically true. That's absolute nonsense. If it's not historically true, let's, let's all go home because there's no point in our being here. And Paul emphasized the importance of the historicity of the atonement in his first letter to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 15, he wrote, What I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. And what did he receive? That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day. And he goes on. He appeared to 500, and he appeared to others, and he appeared to me. If Christ has not been raised, he wrote, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. And then later, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. So do not spiritualize biblical history. Either atonement has been accomplished or it has not been accomplished. But it's a fact one way or the other. What about the finality of the atonement? Well, the atonement of which scripture speaks is the vicarious obedience, expiation, propitiation, reconciliation, and redemption performed by the Lord of glory when once for all he purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. What a wonderful statement that is of what Christ has done for us. And so it's true that Christ is currently in heaven interceding on our behalf. And it's true that each one of us must individually believe and then persevere in our faith. But at the same time, it's true that the atonement is an absolutely completed, finished work of Christ. He said to Telestai, it is finished. All right? There's nothing left to do. We all have things we have to do, but nonetheless it has been accomplished. It's a completed fact. And we know that God will carry it on to completion, as Paul wrote in Philippians 1.6. So what about the uniqueness of the atonement? Well, the sacrifice of Christ was not primarily, as we've said several times now, exemplary. It wasn't just an example. It was an example, but that's not primarily what it was. That was the secondary purpose. So reread the passage from Machen's book on Christianity and liberalism that I showed in our first lecture. I just show a little piece of it here. He says these modern theories of the atonement that, that say it's an example or of God's love or whatever, err in that they ignore the dreadful reality of guilt and they make a mere persuasion of the human will all that is needed for salvation. Let me stop there. That verse I read in the opening prayer from Mark chapter 10. What did Christ say? It's impossible with man. It's not just a mere persuasion of the human will that is necessary. What's necessary is an amazing, miraculous work of God to change the heart, to take someone who is dead in their trespasses and sins and raise them to new life. I remember R.C. Sproul once gave a good illustration of this. He was saying, you know, you often hear this, this image of Christianity, and it says you're a, a sinner is like someone out in the ocean who's floundering around, and they're drowning, and they're flopping around, and somebody throws them the lifesaver, and they lay hold of it, and that's Christianity. He said, no, that's not Christianity. Christianity is you're down on the bottom of the ocean dead. You already drowned. You're down there on the bottom. You're dead. You're gone. Somebody reaches down and grabs you and lifts you back up and breathes new life into you. That's Christianity. You don't do anything. God does it. And yet you do something in this life, but because God has empowered you to do it. So it's not just a mere persuasion of the human will. They do indeed all contain an element of truth. We don't deny there's an exemplary character to the atonement. But these truths are swallowed up in a far greater truth that Christ died instead of us to present us faultless before the throne of God. So I encourage you to go read that whole thing. In fact, I encourage you to go read Machen's book, Christianity and Liberalism. It's a, a wonderful book. So Murray states here, Christ has indeed given us an example that we should follow his steps, 
but it is never proposed that this emulation on our part is to extend to the work of expiation, propitiation, reconciliation, and redemption, which he, and you could say he alone, accomplished. From whatever angle we look upon his sacrifice, we find its uniqueness to be as inviolable as the uniqueness of his person, of his mission, and of his office. So everything we have covered in this course so far in looking at the necessity of the atonement and the nature of the atonement argues for the uniqueness of the atonement. It could only have been accomplished by Jesus Christ, the God-man. There was no other way. Murray summarizes the intrinsic efficacy of the atonement in this way. The atonement is the provision of the Father's love and grace but there is equal need for remembering that the work wrought by Christ was in itself intrinsically adequate to meet all the exigencies created by our sin. Remember, an exigent, and to be an exigency is just to be something that is made necessary by the circumstances. So it, it's intrinsically adequate to meet all the exigencies created by our sin and all the demands of God's holiness and justice. Jesus met all the exigencies arising from our sin, and he procured all the benefits that lead to and are consummated in the liberty of the glory of the children of God. Again, a quote from Scripture almost. He's paraphrasing, I think, Romans 8, 12. It's wonderful when you read Murray. You see the shorter catechism coming out all over the place, little phrases from it. You see Scripture coming out all over the place, even when he doesn't directly quote it. It's just a man who is completely saturated with the Word of God, and it flows out of him. And the Westminster Confession does a good job of stating this in chapter 8, sec, uh, paragraph 5. The Lord Jesus, by his perfect obedience and sacrifice of himself, which he, through the eternal spirit, once offered up unto God, has fully satisfied the justice of his Father and purchased not only reconciliation, but an everlasting inheritance in the kingdom of heaven for those whom the Father has given unto him. What a marvelous statement. So, let's take a look at how to apply this third chapter. We are actually done with it. So, the third chapter talks about the perfection of the atonement in these four ways, and I think if we meditate on each one of these, we'll see that they have importance for us in our daily lives. So, it's historicity. Well, again, reject spiritualizing biblical truth. Don't let yourself get caught up in this funny, weird, ethereal nonsense that our society lives in where people say, oh, I'm a spiritual person, and so on, blah. No, it's historical Christianity, Christ lived, Christ died, Christ rose, Christ is seated. This is historical fact. If it isn't, then there's no point. It's finality. Make your calling and election sure. Do that seriously. Don't take it for granted. Do it seriously. That's why the Bible commands us to do that. It says to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. And then, if you find yourself passing the test, rejoice in the assurance of your ultimate reward. God is faithful. He will complete everything he has said. And look at its uniqueness. Reject multiculturalism and postmodern ideas about truth. It's not that it's okay if it works for me, but it doesn't work for you. No, it may not work for you. That, that could be true. But it's not that something else will work for you. There is one and only one way to be saved. The atonement is unique. So preach Jesus Christ. There is no other way to be saved. And it's efficacy. Christ has done it all. We must humble ourselves, repent, trust, and obey. I add nothing to my salvation. Nothing I will ever do or can do could possibly in any way add to my salvation. It is all of grace that God accepts anything I ever do and calls it a good work. None of it's good properly examined, because all of it is tainted by my sin. It's God's grace completely and totally all the way. But if I have been born again, I have a desire to please him, and I will strive to do the good works that he has prepared for me to do. I will live an obedient life. Never perfect, but it will be there. In preparing for next time, you should read chapter 4 on the extent of the atonement, and we will cover that next time. So let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are amazed, Lord, when we look at your plan of salvation and we consider all that you have done for us in and through Jesus Christ and your Holy Spirit 
And we praise you and thank you, and we pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit this day, Lord. Help us to worship you acceptably, and then help us to go forth this week and worship you by living for you and doing the next right thing. Lord, that we would be obedient in every area of life. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.